Hey guys, this is Drew uh, with Acoustic Collectibles. Welcome back to a brand new video. In this video, we're going to be showing you guys the initial interview that really started me off in making uh, numismatic videos. Um, I don't know, I think it's just a testament and what really started me on this journey to offer more value in the numismatic space than just selling coins. I really wanted to give you guys a perspective on uh, the knowledge I know as a newer dealer and hopefully more knowledge uh, soon about more things. So I hope you guys enjoy this interview. Without further ado, uh, let's start it up. Hey everybody, how's it going? Christian from Treasure Town here, and I'm really excited. We've got Drew Haddock from Akusha Collectibles. Uh, he's a coin dealer out of Texas. A lot of people said you gotta hop on and speak with him, interview him. And so I'm super glad to have you on, Drew. He's a uh, tone numismatist, he, he, or that's sort of his numismatic specialty, I should say. And we'll be talking about that along with a bunch of other stuff, but thanks for being on today. Thank you for having me, Christian. I really appreciate it. So if we, you know, what I, what I like to do is I like to get a little bit of a background for all the viewers. Just there's so many ways people get into coins uh, and then as they progress to where they are now. So if you had to say your coin origin story and sort of how you're involved today, I'd be super interested. Yeah, I'd love to speak on that. So I was at my uh, grandmother's house. This is kind of how all coin stories start, but I was at my grandmother's house uh, my junior year of college and my dad just got let go. Um, from his job at, at Baker Hughes down in Houston. Um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do with going out of college. And one day my grandma just said, hey, Drew, here's this coin collection uh, that I have. It was nothing special, like nothing that, you know, you would send off to a grading company and nothing that would bring you back a bunch of money, I guess. Um, but my grandma was having kind of a rough financial patch, you know, and uh, so she was saying, hey, you know, I, I want to give these to you, but I, I, this is the only thing valuable I have left. And so I ended up buying those from her. Um, I used some of my uh, ring money for like graduating college. I, I don't have a ring. Um, and I spent all that money buying her collection just to keep as a keepsake for the family. Um, Cause it can be a little bit tougher when uh, family members pass on, especially in this hobby that things start to leave or go to a coin shop or go to a pawn shop. And mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to start off, buying something that was very memorable and then ever since then i i started buying coins in holders and i started reselling them and then as soon as um you know everything started to come up the market started to come up and um i i really stopped stopped buying coins and then as soon as the pandemic started like no school was happening i was on a vacation for spring break and i said you know what like I want to start collecting coins, but how can I do that as a college student? And so what I started doing is I started going on eBay. I started going on Instagram, started going on Facebook. I started to make connections. I started to go to shows. Uh, I really just did everything I could um, to make something of this. And going back to when my dad was let go, um, I just didn't want to be that person. You know, I didn't want to work for someone for 15 years or work for them for half my life and say, okay, Drew, it's you know, thank you for working for us. Grab your stuff and you're out of here. Like for me, I, I just don't want to ever have that day in court, if that makes sense. And mm -hmm. I don't know, that's kind of where everything has started. Um, for right now, I'm just selling and uh, trying to grow more connections. Uh, I work with a few wholesalers and I also work with a few guys. Uh, Gary is kind of one of the guys I work with and uh, just a lot of great people in this community. But yeah. Cool. And so um, it sounds like, you know, it's something that's relatively recent in terms of a development for you, but I know you post a lot of cool coins on the, uh, the Instagram. And, and so, uh, and, and again, people had, had mentioned that, that you were somebody to talk to. So how do you kind of feel being almost going in the deep end right away in the hobby? What have been some of the immediate sort of takeaways or lessons that you've learned, um, you know, so soon in? Well, the uh, lesson that I learned, right, is like, my parents and everybody expected me as soon as I graduated college to go find a career job or go find something that uh, gives you the health care and gives you the safety net and gives you the, you know, you can get off at four or whatever. And um, the things that I've learned more in the hobby is like, uh, where do you see yourself in five years? And so like, if you're going in for an interview tomorrow for a job, they'd say, where do you see yourself in five years? I say this all the time. And would you see it yourself in five years with us at this company? And for me, 
um, in the hobby and being completely self-motivated, you have to say every day when you wake up, where do you see yourself in five years, right? Am I going to wake up at noon tomorrow or am I going to wake up at 9 a.m. tomorrow? So that's something that I, is a takeaway for me in any business, but mainly in the coin hobby. Do you see yourself owning a shop in five years? Do you see yourself making less money than you do now in five years, right? So it has to be a constant, constant uh, mind game or uh, that's not really a mind game, but kind of a focus that if you want to make something of yourself, if you want to um, do something that alters your life for the good, um, that's kind of where I see myself in the coin hobby. Hey guys, have you subscribed yet to our channel? If you haven't, click that button below. Hit the, uh, hit the bell so you never miss an episode. Uh, we just took a look at our analytics the other day and it says that 78% of you um, haven't subscribed to our channel yet. So hit that button and make me very happy. Um, another lesson that I really uh, have caught on to is just people just shooting straight with me. Like, um, like I was speaking to, uh, about Gary earlier or speaking about another dealer. Like we all have to make money. We all have to please customers. We all have to do things to uh, make the business flow. And so sometimes it's just easier um, instead of making something, uh, you know, making something difficult. People just say, Hey, that's not for me. Or, Hey, this is for me. And we, the thing about the community and about shows and about dealers is that the more we work together, the more we thank each other, the more we're encouraging of each other, um, the better it is for all of us. And so that's, that's a few takeaways I have. Um, about the coin business and about where I am. Awesome. No, that, uh, that, that's great. And I think the, the working together part, that's a big thing that I'm really trying to focus on is, is getting different people on and, and uh, sort of amplifying a bunch of different voices. And um, I guess one, one, so a few different things. The first that I want to ask is going to be, well, where do you see yourself in five years? And then after that, I want to talk about sort of the coin shows experience and sort of what your bread and butter in terms of, you know, got to make a, a profit if it's if it's selling you know maybe it's with the tone coins maybe it's something else but first where you see yourself in five years and then after that um sort of the experience of going to co coin shows maybe i'll follow up with a more specific right. question but so uh in numismatics in five years my goal is to own like a coin shop um in the houston area mm -hmm. um i think it's a great place for uh people to collect i think it's the right market for it um like i don't know about every other state but like Texas people love America people love numismatics and I think that there's plenty of uh, business to go around in terms of uh, providing for the people and providing for the customers that are in uh, Houston um, so that's kind of where I would see myself in five years um, the and what was your question kind of about coin shows Christian yeah yeah so so you know you mentioned some some dealers like the dealership that I worked in when I was starting out in coins we we really didn't go to coin shows other people right. that's like a huge part they're mostly only seen at shows and only dealing with other dealers how much of what you're doing is you know you mentioned wholesaling but how much of your dealing is with other dealers how much of it is you know selling stuff maybe retail on eBay or or through Instagram um, and, and kind of what's, what is the business model, you know, <laughs> without giving away any trade secrets, but yeah. that you're currently involved in. So like, I would say it's like 50, 50 in terms of like, I source mainly at shows to keep mm -hmm. overhead down. And then I sell a lot on Instagram and I sell a lot to wholesalers. So it's kind of like a 50, 50 at this point, if I see a good deal, or if I see something that, um, a customer or, or dealer would want, I'd buy it. Um, the thing about dealers is that, they have like a designated group where basically if I send CCs to this person, they would pay me more money than, mm -hmm. than a collector would. Right. Or if I have, if I go tomorrow to a show and I buy 25 CCs, right. I could literally sell it, sell it to that person for like the highest amount I could. Um, it's a little bit easier because I don't really have the customer base currently to do that. Um, so I would end up selling like one or two or three CCs and it would take me like a few weeks to do that. But um, mm -hmm. the thing that's a little bit easier is that when you work with wholesalers, they can, you can literally just buy it, put it in a box and you have their sheet of what they would pay and you send it off. Um, the thing, the other part about it is like the other half would be me sourcing and cherry picking and being very specific about what I buy. Because uh, the, I guess the quote that I've been trying to follow is that uh, whenever I put a coin in a package, 
for a customer, it should hurt me. Right. And that sounds weird, but it's like, if, if the world burned down tomorrow and that coin was, was still with me and I haven't sold it, would I be happy with it? Would I be happy with it in my collection? And so sometimes I'm like, I'm buying this toned coin or I'm buying this very unique coin because um, it's going to hurt when I sell it because it's that beautiful or it's that nice. And so it's a win-win because I can, I can help the business by selling to wholesalers, but I can also find really beautiful coins to sell to customers that maximize profit, but also, I don't know, it just, it's a more beautiful part of the hobby, I think, because um, your eye is something that is unique and everyone has their own. And so I really like that part of the business too. So it's a kind of a little bit of a toss up for that. Yeah. I wanted to take a quick break in this interview and ask you, um, how has your numismatic uh, knowledge increased over the past year? Um, I know a lot of us have been at home or haven't, you know, haven't been going to our jobs as much. Maybe uh, you're doing a lot of remote stuff or uh, maybe you're learning from home. Um, how has that time kind of changed for you? Because, you know, now you have a lot more time to focus on your hobbies, focus on maybe numismatics. How has your viewpoint of numismatics changed and also increased over this past year? Uh, make sure to comment that below. Yeah, and I mean, it's probably a neat way to understand more broadly the business as well right. in terms of interacting with wholesale versus retail type. Um, maybe we could get into a little bit in terms of the wholesale business model, sort of what what is their end game? You know, they're, they may be paying the highest on CCs. Is that because they have the best network to sell to or are they marketing it in like a, you know, a TV advertisement or a newspaper advertisement or, you know, do they just feel like they have good connections to buyers who are going to buy it? Uh, and, and how have you kind of gone about dealing with them? Is there any wiggle room or maybe they're paying the best price? So there's not, you know, if they're paying the best price, it's, it makes it very easy for you because you have it sold before you even yeah. buy it. Um, what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of working with a, a wholesaler? So the, the wholesale part is um, it's, it's super unique just because the pricing um, they just, like I said, they send you a list and it kind of helps you guide you. So like if I go to a show or if something's hot in the market right now, um, I'm not sure, sure where they or why or how they form these numbers. Um, I'm thinking maybe they have a contract that nobody else has um, that, you know, when someone signs a contract, they're probably supposed to be held, held up to a certain end in terms of how many coins they're providing of which caliber, which grade and even like BU Morgans or CC Morgans. Um, but what the hot things right now that I kind of look for, like um, I'm looking at Morgan dollars graded. I'm looking at CCs. I'm looking at high reliefs. Um, a lot of people are like, oh, high reliefs are hot right now. And I'm like, okay, well, which dealer is going to give me the most money for them? And, and, there's, and then there may be some where you buy 10 and then you say, oh, hey, this one looks unk or this one looks... Uh, AU and I only paid 150 bucks for it. And when I get it mm -hmm. graded, it might come back between 500 and 750 bucks, you know? And so um, kind of just cherry picking in that, but with wholesalers um, it's a unique relationship because they've literally spent like years and years um, finding a connection within the numismatic space that you necessarily don't have. And so I think a real perk of that is that they're saying, Hey, come work with me, send, sell to me. And that's, and that's something that's pretty beautiful about it because I can go to a show and I can have money on the spot. Um, I could sit, put in a box and send it off um, with other stuff. It can be a little bit more difficult, like the rare stuff that I like to sell on my own. Um, but there's a lot of perks about it. Um, I don't really know too many bad parts about uh, selling to wholesalers other than if you're not developing your own brand within the space, um, you're going to be irrelevant. So like, for me, um, I'm 23. And if I want to make it till I'm 75, say in uh, the numismatic space, how am I going to stay relevant if I completely sell the wholesalers? Right. Mm -hmm. And so I would say a downside of it is like, Hey, if I get a batch of CCs, I should try to sell two or three for higher than what I would pay, give it to a wholesaler or, Hey, what do you like selling? What do your customers like? Find that also, because if you spend every single day looking out for a wholesaler, um, you, you are working for someone else. Are you enjoying the video so far? If you are, 
please leave a like because if you leave a like it helps us uh, reach out to more numismatists on YouTube and give them more information that we're trying to pass on to you, you know, in a sense. And so if you can pair that wholesaling side of things, which is a really great aspect of numismatics and also uh, what you can find for your customers that they would love and would uh, hold up your business I think it's just a great combo, but that's, that's a dislike that I have about it. You have to want it for yourself. And um, if you want to make a little bit of money or if you want to make a little bit of money for the house or buy something, or I think wholesaling and selling to wholesalers is a great thing. But like I said, if you, it just depends on where your plan is in the space. And I think that's very important. Yeah, no, I think that that, that makes a lot of sense. And, and I didn't even anticipate you, you talking about the branding. I'd like to to touch on that after the next question, but I think that it, it uh, certainly makes a, a lot of sense to, yeah. to think that through. Um, in terms of these shows, like, is your experience that you can go around, you know, say, you know, you have such and such CCs and 21s and, uh, you know, high reliefs lined up. Are there a lot of dealers that are just unaware of the wholesale possibilities and maybe don't sell enough online where you can sort of clean out a lot of dealers and, and do pretty well? Uh, or, you know, does that dry up or, or maybe, um, you know, may, maybe it's a pretty easy yeah. way to to go about it? Well, that's a great question, because uh, many dealers, I would say they, they buy collections and then they only show up at shows. And so um, for them, they're like and then you talk to them and they say, hey, you know, this is just my retirement side gig or it's my you know, it's just a temporary thing for me. And, and I understand that that's that's their walk. And what they're doing in uh, the numismatic space. But like I said, there's that, and then there's the other side of people that come in and say, I know who's going to pay the most. I know who's going to do the most. And so like, you know, round table and a bunch of other people, um, someone might be buying something for the most, and then they would be sending it to that dealer and their dealer would be sending it back to them. It's, it's a really, I think round table is a good network. And there's also other higher up networks that people pay to get into um, mm -hmm. just so, you can meet a lot of connections and um, help out in the space. But I think that with the guys that are older in the space that don't get on Facebook, don't get on Instagram, um, don't, they only go to shows. I think that when they go up to their table, you know, when's the last time they picked up a gray sheet or when's the last time they went to price guide or when's the last time they asked uh, the wholesalers what they wanted or, um, most of the time when I find a good deal, it's that they bought a collection. Um, they don't know where the market is right now because it's always changing. And then I end up buying something for a great deal. And so that's kind of where uh, my bread and butter is at the shows. And it's really helped me. Um, I don't know. It's really helped a lot of us. Um, they make their money also. But if mm -hmm. everyone was kind of caught up like that, it, it would be a little bit more helpful for them but I'm also thankful for the little bit of room that they give me, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, definitely they need to, to move and they need people who are able to, to put food on their own table, you know, that are right. buying from them consistently. So the ecosystem price is healthy in that sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, going back to the branding though, I mean, where, where can people find you and, and sort of what type of content do you put out? I've certainly seen some of it uh, and, and gotten introduced to you before we said hi to each other here. Right. And then w what do you view as the, the different advantages of different platforms out there for coins that you might have used? So I, I'm currently using Instagram just because of the time that I currently have. So when I post a picture or post a video, it's kind of um, you're wanting to paint a story kind of where a coin would be or provide it in the best light, or it kind of has to tell its own story while it's being posted it's not very much of a YouTube thing. YouTube's kind of more rigorous and doing a lot of things with editing and getting people on and research. Um, and so I think that the way to stay competitive in the next few years, um, even in the next 20 years, like most of the people that we're going to be advertising in, to in 20 years are, are 50 year olds now or 50 year olds and younger. So um, if, if you start a business and you start a website and YouTube, and Instagram and go fully after it, I think that you will be remain competitive in the next few years. Um, the way I've kind of been doing it as of late, which has been almost like a crutch has been Instagram. Um, it's been a site that's not of my own, which is something that I think is a flaw with my business that I'm trying to work towards. Um, but with everything that's going on, I think that 
uh, Instagram is a great place to start. Um, but I would say moving more into a content branded and if you can spend more time a day trying to invest in uh, a website or invest in a video, just document what you like to do with your business or document things like this. I think that it would start to drive people more to uh, your business and who you are and uh, what you like to do. Um, I, I even see like, you know, the coin geek or um, I see Daniel or, you know, the other guy, I forgot what it is. Yeah. Uh, coin no, help you. Yeah. yeah, they're, yeah. they're great guys. Right. But I watch a video and they're like, Hey, uh, this is my new inventory I got today. Right. Or, Hey, this just came back from grading and it'll be on my website. Right. Well, I go down, scroll down, I click on it. It's sold. Right. And my question was before view two videos, would someone have to walk into their shop and say, let me give you the money for it or where they have to eat 13% on eBay for them to buy it. Mm -hmm. Now it's like, I'm going to upload a five minute video uh, talking about NGC and the coins that I made. And if I have to take a 3% PayPal cut or whatever else, they're making their money and it's really growing the hobby. And I think that's something that's really missing about the hobby right now is just new minds and new, I guess, connections and new uh, content. Like I don't see, apart from a few people, I don't see like anything like, how to negotiate a show or uh, I don't see a whole lot of stuff on YouTube where I would say like it's oversaturated. So I guess mm -hmm. a need in the hobby right now is someone that would say, um, let me upload once a day or uh, let me go after some hard questions that are in the hobby or where the hobby is going. And I think interviews like this are, are extremely important for that. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's cool. And I think you've, you've thought, thought it through quite well. You know, I, I, I feel like I'm not active at all really on, on Instagram. I like to look, I don't post much. And recently I haven't been posting any coins at all. Uh, I think the advantage there that I've seen is it seems like more serious collectors are there. And I think some serious collectors are on YouTube too, but the natural reach of the algorithm means plus, you know, I, I'm also not making most of my content is not super, super advanced. I've been trying to get some people who know a ton, like, like this sort of interview. Um, right. so that we do, do hit some, some more, you know, ideally I'm getting more knowledgeable as we go along as well. And, and, uh, talking about interesting things. And, mm -hmm. and so the YouTube advantage I think is that it really can index in, whereas, you know, it's, it's tough to like search in and then have Instagram results pop up. I mean, the hashtag to some extent, but there's, you know, it, it's, uh, it, there's a lot of difference. I'm not active on Facebook. I don't know if you do much over there. And then I'm not in any of the groups. I've heard roundtables. Great. Uh, I don't yeah. know if CE is, is still strong, but um, I guess, you know, the other thing is that I'm probably going to take a few clips from here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what, if I could get your on the spot thought um, since you mentioned it, you know, negotiating at a coin show, what do you, what do you kind of, how do you go about doing that? And what do you think the etiquette is, you know, in a, in a smart way to, to do that successfully? Well, I think that the more knowledge that you have walking into a deal is, is important. So um, the way I kind of structure going to a table and making a decision is like, uh, what does price guide say? What does gray sheet say? What is wholesalers willing to pay me? Right. And if you can find somewhere in between what wholesalers can pay you and what a price guide is, right. That's kind of where I walk into things and I break it down super simple. Like they know the same numbers that I'm going to tell them. And mm -hmm. so um, if the more knowledge, you know, walking into something um, is very important. Um, the, the thing that I have the most problem with at a show is when a, someone walks up to you and they start looking at your feet and they look at your head and then they try to look for your badge and they're like, are you a dealer? Right. And I'm like, why does that matter? Right. Yeah, and yeah. so that they would say like, oh, you're a dealer. OK, let me. OK, 10 percent off all these prices or um, I'm going to do a deal for you. Why does that have to be a thing? Right. Like if you're trying to figure out if I'm a collector or a dealer that for me, that's a little bit eerie. You know, I think it's a little bit more shady for me. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Cause for, when I go to a coin show, I have a price sticker on it. Like, uh, and if it's a good deal and if it's something you want, then that's kind of where I would shoot straight with you and say, okay, Hey. And, and like when you're selling at a coin show, it's also interesting. Cause you say, Hey, this is what I paid for it. Um, Hey, this is what the sticker says. I can knock five bucks off for you. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. And most of the time someone says, I just don't have any room or uh, I understand you have to make 10 bucks or I understand you have to make five bucks um, and I like it and I'll buy it. Right. And so sometimes like it's just easier to say, hey, this is where I'm at on it. Um, 
with the etiquette, uh, you just stand at the table, be very polite. Hey, do you have a few moments so I can see this coin? Um, I wouldn't be in a rush. I'd be okay. completely focused kind of on what uh, you're looking at. Uh, I've seen guys come up to a table and cut me off and go like this and pound on the, on the table and ask for something for me. If, if for me, I just say, Hey, can I take a look at this coin? Um, I'd love to see it. Um, what's your best on it? Cause there's always, there's a sticker on the back or something. What's your best on it. And then I kind of worked my brain in from there, you know, like if it's selling for 140 for comps, then I'll try to get it for 115 or I'll try to get it for 110. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just, I just try to be very, uh, very touchy and I don't want to be too pushy in terms of getting them to do something. And then when something else pops up and they know that I like it and I pass by, they're like, Oh, Hey, I just picked this up or Hey, would you like this? And I don't know if you, if you're being your best self and trying to be nice to people and trying to really work with them. I mean, if you, if you ran through a show and, and picked everything up and bought as much as you could, like we're there for that. But I also think there is a touchy part of it of being, solely focused on the deal that you're making um, rather than just running around. So for me, I just, I don't know, I'm kind of consumed with the table and being nice to the person and seeing how their day is. Some dealers are having a tough day, you know, or they're Mm -hmm. having a a rough day. So it's sometimes it's good just to hear what they have to say and then move on. But I think those are some things that might help somebody making a decision with buying stuff. Definitely. I think, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense in terms of the relationships part. I mean, how often do you say you, you're interacting with a deal at like a small time dealer that you maybe haven't seen much before? Or are you really doing business with the same guys over and over again? How national, you know, are you flying around the country or are you trying to hit Houston, Texas, maybe general Southern seaboard area shows? Uh, how do you, if you take a little bit of a step back, how you're operating at the shows, how, do, how does the process look for you? So we kind of uh, see what shows we use CoinZip and other things to figure out what good shows there are. Um, most of the time you hear about it like a month in advance, like, oh, Summer Fun or oh, ANA. Um, for those shows, we don't mind. I drive everywhere, but we don't mind driving and going the distance. Mm-hmm. But with like 30 dealer shows, like I'll, I'll drive four hours or whatever, but it kind of has to be like a good show for you to drive a certain amount. So I drive, I could drive anywhere between here in Florida or here in uh, Chicago is where I'm driving next month for a and um, Yeah. So you just, I mean, if you're completely consumed, I mean, not consumed, but completely dedicated to what you're doing. Um, sometimes you just have to drive there and go and experience and try to get the best you can out of it. Um, sometimes it'll cost you, but every time that I've left the show, I've always made my money back and more. And then I've always had great connections there. Um, Mm. and for like local stuff, um, you know, I always try to show up to a shop or I ask what they have in the, in the meantime, or ask what has come in. And then, you know, sometimes I bring them a box of ammo. That's Texas. We bring a box of ammo and we, (laughs) we talk for an hour or whatever. We take a seat. I bring them my collection that I like, you know, I brought a bill in for, uh, it, it has like a really cool 1776, uh, serial number on it. Um, Ooh. yeah, but I, sh- I brought that into a shop to show them and they're like, okay, can I post this on my Instagram? And then, you know, if you ever heard of, uh, Royal Coins Houston or Bullionaire, yeah. all yeah. those guys, yeah. like I talk to them, try to talk to them once a week in the shop. And so mm-hmm. I go there too, and they offer me great deals. And so it's kind of like, like what I'm going back to is if you're committed and if you want something to last, um, really push every avenue that you can every single day. So I'm writing Blake, Royal Coins Houston. I'm writing Luis. Hey, what do you got? Um, can we sit down this week and talk about it? Um, I'll drive there, whatever. I'll, I'll send a check. Um, if we got to get in a car tomorrow and drive 16 hours to Orlando, like it's no problem. That's what we did. Uh, if we're mm-hmm. driving back, you know, I don't, you know, I drove 16 hours back and I'll happily do it again. So you just, the mentality you have to have in any business and even in life, it's like, yes, it's going to happen. Like um, there's a, there's a car accident on the way to church. Yes. I'm going to church. I don't care. I'm mm-hmm. waiting. Um, if I'm going to a coin deal, yes. Um, I'm going to find the money to do it. Or yes. I, if you have a yes mentality in most things you do, um, you'll get it done. And so um, the way I wake up every day, it's like, yes, I'm going to make this day worth it. Yes. I'm going to continue what I, what I like to do. 
And that's kind of where I, I sit with coin shows and uh, local dealers. Yeah. That's awesome. No, I, that's a great mentality to have too. I think, I think that, that that's a winning one. Um, and in terms of, I'm trying to think in terms one, one quick question before we get to maybe a few more questions right. and then wrap up. Um, what, what is a Kusha? What's that coming from, you know, for a, a northerner right outside of New York city, like myself, maybe it's something I'm totally missing on, or maybe it's a family name, but where's it from? So I, um, I was in my sophomore year of college, I'm actually like starting on my junior year. I apologize. And, uh, they, my teacher, we we're in business law and he's a super cool guy. You, know, you have the good teachers, like the teachers that take it easy on you. You'll never remember their names and you'll never mm-hmm. know who they are. And they're just very kind of milk toast. And there's some professors like my business law professor that, uh, you know, shoots it straight, like wants you to be the best person. And so he's like, uh, our extra credit this this uh, semester, and I thought it was like a big thing, like a 12-page project or something. He's like, go to a dog shelter and spend three hours there and see, see if you can help somebody, right? And so I went to a, the dog shelter with my mom, and then there was this name of this dog. It's like, it's just a Kusha, right? And I'm like, oh, that's a cool name. Let me look it up and let me figure out the meaning. And um, it was a really cool dog, and I spent a lot of time with it. And then I looked it up and there was no definition. There's no name. There was no, so I don't know who made it, who made the name. Um, But uh, I guess uh, when I started selling coins, I had this other, it was like Rainbow Morgan Lover. That was my name on Instagram. But Uh I kind of wanted to have a a genesis or a a beginning of of when my coin business started. And so when I chose Akusha, it was like, this name isn't defined. This name isn't taken from anybody else. This name is something that's completely organic and something that I can build on and something that I, when someone says Akusha, where, where does it pop up in their mind? And so that's kind of where um, it's kind of a a new beginning in terms of a name and also something that I can build on in terms of a brand. Um, But it was a really, really good experience when I went to the dog shelter. It was really good. That's cool. Wow. That's, that's a great story. And I mean, yeah, that's what Akusha now. Yeah. That, that's the only thing that's defined. It's like Christian Harch. I'm the only guy in the world. He's got that <laughs> name spelled right. the way it is. So, it, you know, it's, it's, uh, I think that's super, super cool. And, and it sticks out too, you know, not that it's easy to pronounce, right. but easy to get, but it, it, it's, it's its own thing. So, yeah. so that's great. Um, I'm going back to one thing that I had some questions on. So, you know, you mentioned doing mostly shows, obviously if you, if you were, uh, opening a coin shop, what do you think that would, you know, what would get you to the point that you would do it? And what are some of the, you know, pros and cons that you would anticipate uh, in, in the doing a coin shop process? So the pros would be, uh, so like I was talking about earlier, um, if I'm not at a coin show, like when I wake up for a coin show, I wake up at 7.30, get to the show at eight, and I put my head down at midnight. And that's when I stop thinking about coins. And then it's the same thing when I get home, right? So I wake up, I package up my orders, I start sourcing, I start selling, I start um, figuring out what I'm supposed to do with my business. And so for a coin shop, it's a little bit easier because if you already have these things figured out with less overhead that you have, you can, when someone brings a coin to the shop, right, you have a perfect story for it. And Mm -hmm. I guess the perfect story uh, mantra that I kind of created is that every coin has its perfect story. So um, if it has to go to CAC or if it has to be regraded or if it has to go to this uh, this auction house or if the best place to sell it is on Instagram or if the best place to sell it is on eBay, like I could sell something on eBay, $500 more than what I could sell it on Facebook or Instagram for. Every co- coin kind of has its story. And so um, with a coin shop, if you already know uh, if some, someone starts to bring things to you, it's easier to say, okay, I already know the story for this coin, or I know how this one will sell, or I know how to get rid of this coin if it's not making me any money. And so uh, it would be a little bit easier because you can go home every night saying, I don't have to one source and sell, but I can just sell, right? And sometimes that's a little bit easier because you're not com- completely thinking about it all the time. Um, mm-hmm. You can kind of put it in its rightful place um, in your, in your, uh, in your heart and kind of in your life. And so uh, for me, owning a, owning a coin business would be a little bit easier because um, the sourcing part is going to be held up by that capital infused into it. Um, the real 
drawback right now of why I'm not doing it is that one, do I have the customers for it? Um, I don't think so. And Mm -hmm. um, it's something that will have to grow when you open a coin shop. Not everything's perfect and yet and planned. Um, But also there's like the capital aspect, like, like when I was talking to Blake Royal Coins Houston, he's like, okay, you might have 150 grand a day. Someone walks in. Okay. You have four grand. That's like, like what, what are you going to do? Are you going to be able to sell that? Are you going to be able to move it? Um, And so it's some questions that you have to say, like you question yourself and ask yourself about it. And then you plan it out through time and say, okay, I'm ready for this next step or, okay, I need to invest more time here. So it's kind of a growing pain that you have to constantly be looking for. And so the reason why coin shops five years away is because you have to be building on your knowledge of coins. You have to be building on uh, business practices. You have to be building on client lists. You have to be building on what to do with every single coin. And then when you're able to, you can open a coin shop and be building on that. But if someone says, oh, you're in the coin business for a year, let's open a coin shop. I'm like, I don't know anything about coins. Why would I be opening a coin shop? And so you have to be constantly asking yourself, am I ready for this? Or am I ready for this next step? Even if it's not a coin shop, Um, just know yourself and you'll be successful. So. Awesome. No, that's super helpful. I think I'll, I'm going to ask you this question and then maybe one more and then we'll wrap up. But wh- where do you see the coin market and maybe throw in a bold prediction uh, that, that has to be bold 10 years from now? Um, how do you think it's going to be evolving? So I think that a lot of where the coin market is, is based on um, the national debt, but also how much money is, be- is being printed. Um, mm-hmm. The thing about like, the thing about when the world tells you, hey, rich men have billions of dollars in their account and rich men have, they save their money and all this stuff, right? And I'm like, so if they're rich, right? If, if, they're, if they're a millionaire, billionaire, whatever, um, and they know that the dollar tomorrow is going to be worth less than it was today, then why? what are they doing with their money? So they're either buying real estate, they're buying uh, rare collectibles that are going to be appreciating in value. Um, so I think that as people as this, uh, I guess, presidency continues. Um, I don't agree with who is, I mean, we're on YouTube, so it doesn't matter, but I don't agree with what's happening in this, uh, administration, but I do say that if we're going to be printing trillions and trillions of dollars and infusing it into the economy, uh, our dollars going to be worth less. And when our dollar is worth less and you can buy less, people are going to be pulling out of the stock market. Um, the stock market hasn't been doing good, you know, but the, and the coin market's been doing great because someone says, and a lot of people would say when the economy is doing bad, what's going to last, what's going to keep my money, what's going to appreciate over time. And so I would say, um, long-term for coins, it's going to be on an upward trajectory. Um, Mm -hmm. that's how it's been for, since the beginning really of coins, it's been on an upward trajectory, but I guess the more damage that, uh, people do uh, in the government and mismanagement and also just where uh, society is going with um, what they value. I think that even at past coins, there's going to be things like shoes, toys. I mean, it's going to be explosive. It's going to be propping up a large part of our economy because uh, infusing money into the economy is never good. I mean, and that's kind of what we're seeing right now. If you guys made it to the end, thank you so much. Uh, like I said, this interview really did put the ball rolling for us as people that wanted to create value in the numismatic space. Um, like I said, again, if you guys do uh, want to like this video, it'll help reach no- more numismatists. If you guys want to comment uh, what you thought of the video, that'd be great. And subscribe uh, if you're new because you don't want to miss an episode.